afternoon and acutely conscious of the fact that I'm all that stands between you and your weekend, so I won't keep you for very long. But I do want to start by saying that I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here and to be asked to close what I know has been, and I've listened to this final session uh, with interest. Unfortunately, I couldn't be with you this morning. Uh, I know it was an informative and uh, valuable conference. Can I thank uh, Sheila Dixon, your President, and your Chief Exec Executive Officer, Liam Doran, for the kind invitation. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the INMO for the leadership that you've shown in committing so clearly to the agenda of quality and patient safety in organising this meeting. And in particular, I'd like to welcome and recognise one of the very significant purposes of this morning's proceedings, which was to share learning from the patient safety incidents and issues that arose in Mid-Staffordshire, and ultimately analysing and understanding patient safety incidents when they do occur is one of the key elements uh, of addressing patient safety and that sharing that learning is an essential part of the improvement in quality and patient safety. And I'm glad to have an opportunity to pay tribute and I hope as a non-patronising way to the nursing profession for the leadership that you have shown in relation to patient safety over many years. And I think you've led the way in performance in terms of patient safety principles and procedures when compared to other professional groups, particularly my own I would say. We see evidence of this in our reports on things as diverse as medication safety and hand hygiene and on the commitment to things like open disclosure and reporting through our adverse event surveillance systems. As the lar largest singus, single prof uh, profession in healthcare delivery and the one with the most direct continuing contact with patients, the role of nursing in improving patient safety is not only central, it is primary. There's a good story which illustrates this very well, some of you may well be familiar with it and I'll briefly share it with you. But it is described in an article simply called The Checklist, which is an article in The New Yorker from about three, maybe four years ago, by a chap by the name of Atul Gawande, who's an honoured writer, but also a staff surgeon in the Brigham and Women's in, in Boston. Uh, uh, as I say, it's called The Checklist, and it's about a physician in Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, in Maryland, called Professor Peter Pronovist. He's an intensive care physician. And he introduced a five simple step checklist for preparing patients in intensive care units for the insertion of central catheter lines, applying learning that we've had for many, many years. And at that time, catheter line infection, like in many intensive care units and hospitals, was a significant source of mortality, morbidity and cost, and it's preventable, entirely preventable. A key step in the implementation of the five step checklist was to empower all staff, but particularly nursing staff in the intensive care facilities to intervene and to physically stop other staff who are conducting those procedures without following the checklist and its basic elements. And the simple implementation, and the story is a very powerful one in that article which I recommend to you, um, all but eliminated catheter line infection from that particular unit. So much so that it was written up in an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, peer review literature, and replicated in quite a number of uh, ICU departments throughout the US, including throughout the whole of the state of Michigan, which was also subsequently written up in the Annals of Internal Medicine, I think. And I think it's a clear example of the importance of team working and reducing power distance between different professionals and of the importance of empowering all staff involved in patient care to intervene to improve patient safety. And I've at least tried to recognise this key interaction in my approach to patient safety and to the leadership responsibilities that I have. To that end, I work very closely with Sheila O'Malley, the Chief Nursing Officer, who I'm glad to say here with me this afternoon, and who is also with me a key member of the Implementation Steering Group on Patient Safety. We continue to work extremely closely on this agenda and all of its elements, uh, which I see as not being the preserve of any one individual professional group, but rather the responsibility of all of us. And I regard your invitation to me to attend this afternoon as a statement of your commitment and desire to see strengthening and improving roles and relationships between the nursing and medical professions as well as other professionals in the pursuit of patient safety and quality and that I very much welcome. Uh, nurses and midwives have proven their ability to embrace significant change and challenge in their provision of enhanced care such as physical and psychosocial assessments, prescribing of medications and ionising radiation, caseload management, delivery, delivery of nurse-led and midwifery-led clinics and nurse-led admission and discharge policies. And while there's substantial frustration, particularly in the context of the environment we find ourselves in at the moment, I think that those examples of leadership are there to be seen and, and, and recognised. There is a temptation, I think, to be overwhelmed by the nature and the scale of the challenges that we all collectively face at this particular time. 
to deliver accessible, high quality and equitable health care of a standard that we would all aspire to for ourselves within the current economic climate and the challenges that that poses for each and every one of us, uh, the, it, the context being the particularly serious deterioration in our public finances. And that can direct, and we all know this, energy and commitment away from the management of change which is fundamental to the optimum delivery of services, whatever shade the physical and economic backdrop might actually be. And I've no doubt that well, we all collectively will rise to that challenge. We've begun a new era in Irish healthcare, an era of patient safety and quality. And as I'm sure you'll know, the agenda of patient safety and quality, particularly in Ireland, is a relatively new one, really only since about the middle 2000s, uh, maybe going back uh, for some further distance in other jurisdictions, back as far as 1990, for example, in the US with the publication of Tuer as Human, the seminal publication that woke everybody up to the fact that a jumbo jet a day of people were dying in a preventable way uh, in the US healthcare system as a consequence of avoidable patient safety incidents. And as fundamental as clean water and sanitation were for the 20th century, the patient safety agenda will prove to be for the 21st century. Patient safety and quality assurance as guiding principles for change align very well with the agenda of operational efficiency and effectiveness of which we hear so much these days. They bring the requirement for evidence as the basis of decisions, an essential part of a new health paradigm. The key question for us today is how the processes and the environment through which health services are provided can be reconfigured to promote efficient and effective care and to eliminate systemic problems that lead to harmful outcomes. And this requires a commitment to new skills that certainly many of us in various different health professions have not had well developed either in our undergraduate or, as it were, postgraduate and on-the-job uh, training. These include such things as teamwork, process reconfiguration, ICT, modernisation of delivery of health services, patient involvement and patient empowerment, new skills and competencies that must join with our more traditional analytical approaches to create the capacity to make our health system safer and more effective for patients. As you'll know, the Government has committed us to the establishment of the Patient Safety Authority in the Programme for Government, which will allow us to build on the good work on patient safety to date and to develop further provision for patient advocacy, for leadership development, for handling of complaints and for the development of better systems of adverse incident reporting, intelligence and most crucially, in my opinion, learning. A discussion paper setting out the possible functions of the, of the Patient Safety Authority has been prepared and is with the Minister for consideration and this is an agenda we're anxious to move on quite quickly. And we're in the process of, and you will get to hear as an organisation from an invitational point of view in the coming weeks, some work that we'll be doing in the early new year to engage with other authorities and jurisdictions who may be able to provide leadership and direction to us in this area. Government approval, you'll be aware, by the previous government was given to the recommendations of the Commission on patient safety and quality, the so-called Madden Report. And I had the responsibility of chairing the implementation phase of that, which lasted for 18 months up to the end of 2010. And not by any means have we achieved all of the uh, elements that that would have made provision for, but I would argue we're, we're, we're substantially improved in terms of our approach to patient safety. And there's strong evidence that the experience of patients in that regard is improving and that the culture is changing. As part of that implementation, we've already introduced measures to protect so-called whistleblowers. We're introducing in the fourth health, forthcoming Health Information Bill, which we hope to publish early in the new year, requirements for reporting of certain adverse events, as well as protections from freedom of information, for information derived from audit and other quality assurance processes that are intrinsic to the culture and the development of a culture of patient safety and measurement. A centrepiece of our legislative efforts will be the, at this stage, now advanced proposals in relation to licensing of healthcare facilities. And you'll also be very aware of good work which has been undertaken by, uh, under Dr Phillips Crowley's directorate in the HSE, but specifically led by Maureen Flynn, who um, I had an opportunity to meet with yesterday and to review some of the content of that work, and it's most impressive indeed, I would say. And I think that this is one of the most critical parts of the whole agenda of quality and patient safety. We can't find mechanisms of getting our governance right. That's the basic common pathway for everything else we need to do to improve patient safety. So I see it as a critical piece and I look forward to your support in relation to it. The Health Information and Quality Authority has recently submitted standards for safer, better health care, which are now under consideration by us and the Minister, with a view to them being approved as standards in the meaning of the 2007 Health Act, which is the act that established HICWA and its powers. 
and that will allow HICWIC to monitor according to those and for those to effectively become pre-licensing standards and to ultimately form the basis of the licence requirements that will in time uh, follow enactment of the legislation in relation to licensing. On clinical effectiveness, which is a strong part of the themes of the Madden Commission dealing with both evidence-based guidelines and audit, we have established a national process with significant support from among your own professions, which provides for the development and adoption of national clinical guidelines and audit, which are mandated by all parties who need to, to buy in and engage with, if you like, the best way to manage a particular condition. Their implementation will be facilita facilitated by being part of the standards for safer, better healthcare that I've mentioned as well as two other levers such as insurance and time, quality-based purchasing which we need to progress much more towards, indemnity requirements and involvement of patients, crucially, in the development and promulgation of guidance, people who receive services having a greater understanding of the quality and standard of care they should be receiving. We're progressing the development of a first point of contact for patient concerns in relation to clinical care, identifying means to enable regulatory bodies to collaborate and to collaborate safely on areas of common interest, progressing a means by which the initial investigation of complaints by professional regulatory bodies could be managed using a common or consistent framework and approach, and elements of the Health Information Bill, protecting exchange of information between uh, regulatory bodies will be important in that regard. We're also advancing the establishment of a robust credentialing system that will enable employers and professional regulatory bodies to share and verify information regarding the qualifications, competencies and disciplinary record of all regulated professionals in the Irish healthcare system on an ongoing systematic basis. And I've mentioned the issue of health information and flow of information, which is another crucial area in my view. And the Department will publish the Health Information Bill in the new year, as I've mentioned, and that will facilitate and enable, and its purpose is to be there to facilitate, facilitate and enable use of information in the first instance, whether that's by the public, by patients, by professionals, by managers, or by policymakers. So, giving people information and enabling them to use that information at the point at which they need it. It will include a legal framework for the establishment of a unique patient identifier. And coupled with all of that, we're making progress on information standards and on the development and adoption of modern ICT. And in terms of patient safety, ICT is probably, um, in quantitative terms, one of, the, one of the biggest potential contributors. Uh, it can virtually eliminate some of the common sources of medication error uh, which account for more than 50% in incident number terms of patient safety incidents. Uh, the Department supported the joint initiative, which some of you may be aware of, launched by the Office of the Ombudsman earlier in, 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 in the autumn in September with health and social care providers and other relevant parties in health provision to guide the public on how to make a complaint about public health and or social care services. And the aim of that initiative is to publicise the fact that whatever a complainant's age, gender, marital status, family status, nationality, sexual orientation or religion, that he or she would have a right to be treated with dignity and respect, to have their say and to be listened to, to complain if they are not happy, not happy with something, and to feel confident, most importantly, that their complaint will be dealt with fairly. There are a number of other more specific developments of which you will no doubt be aware. We had some mention earlier on of the provisions of the new Nursing and Midwifery Bill, which was published in 2010 and has completed its report in fifth stages in the Dáil on the 11th of October. And the bill is scheduled now to be debated in the Shannon uh, later this month. The purpose of that bill, as you know, would be to enhance the protection of the public in its dealings with nurses and midwives and to ensure the integrity of the practice of nursing and midwifery. And it is aligned in many respects with the provisions of the Medical Practitioners Act and bringing a greater consistency to, if you like, the, the mono-specialty regulatory frameworks we have around each of the individual professional groups like pharmacy, dentistry, medicine and so on. It will provide for a modern, efficient, transparent and accountable system for the regulation of nursing and midwifery professions, which will satisfy the public and these professions that all nurses and midwives are appropriately qualified and competent to practice in a manner, in a safe manner and on an ongoing basis. It provides for the recognition of midwifery as a separate and distinct profession, and this is stated in the Bill and reflected in the title of the legislation, the Nurses and Midwifery Bill, and throughout the Bill and in the title of the Nursing and Midwifery Board of Ireland. You'll all be familiar, I'm sure, with the recently produced strategic framework for role expansion, promoting quality and patient care. It is focused on enhancing and expanding the role of staff nurses and staff midwives, clinical nurse and midwifery specialists, and advanced nurse and midwifery practitioners, and is a cornerstone in strengthening patient protection, as well as fulfilling the developing needs of the nursing profession. 
Examples of practice in this policy document highlight how nurses and midwives have expanded their practice in line with service need in recent years. The Department of Health will shortly commence a review of the undergraduate nursing and midwifery degree programmes and has appointed somebody to lead that. The review will examine the effectiveness and efficiency of the current undergraduate degree programmes which have been in place since 2002 for nursing and since 2006 for midwifery, midwifery and integrated children and general programmes. Undergraduate nursing and midwifery programmes should deliver graduates who are educated and prepared to practice in a modern health service contributing to effective service delivery. The review will be guided by a review group which will represent all of the key stakeholders. There will be widespread consultation as part of the review and I'd encourage and look forward to your uh, contribution to that. On a slightly different subject and really just uh, shamelessly using the opportunity that I have in front of you, uh, in respect of public health, I chair a group which has been uh, established to review and assess and make provision for a new framework for public health. The aim to develop a high level policy framework for public health to cover the period up to 2020. And it will seek to bring into reality the provisions that are in the programme for government with regard to health and well being of the whole population. It will be, seek to be Ireland's vision for a healthier population that is protected from public health threats, living in a healthier and more sustainable environment with increased social and economic productivity and greater social inclusion. I know we've already had a significant amount of input through our planned large-scale national and regional consultations from the nursing and military professions and we've also had input through the call for public submissions which went on over the course of August and September and I look forward to your continuing support with that attempt to really change the paradigm uh, to rebalance our focus on health uh, and well-being as distinct from solely on disease uh, and illness. So if I can uh, conclude, um, as the largest, single largest professional group, nurses and midwives play a pivotal role in the delivery of healthcare across all sectors of our health services. And patient safety and quality are at the core of what we all want to achieve. None of us comes to work to do anything other than to promote a safe and effective uh, an end product for the people who depend on our work. And these patient safety and quality are powerful drivers of reform and improvement in services and need to be much, much more to the fore in our consideration of configuration of services. The health system is striving to provide patients with fully integrated health care that is easy to access and that is externally benchmarked. All nurses and midwives have a, a very important role, as I've argued, to support the pace and direction of that health care reform and challenge. But no one single profession and no one single stratum of our healthcare system can do it alone. And if I could leave you with an old Irish proverb, Erskaha Kaila Avaras Nadina, people live in one another's shelter, or put more simply, we are interdependent. Thanks for your attention.